the show. I'm Chris Adler. Each episode, I host a different guest in a different location. You can find all the episodes at Adler.tv. My guest this week is comedian and radio host Matt Mitchell, a.k.a. Casio Kid. He was in town performing at the Stardom Comedy Club, so we met in the green room at the club before his set for a chat. Check it out. This next gentleman you know from the radio as Casio. Put your hands together for Matt Mitchell. Know him from, his, from his days on the Rick and Bubba show, you might know him from his days on Jay Leno Tonight Show. Uh, he's got his unbelievably successful, funny show out of Huntsville. It's a morning show on the Rocket. Uh, he's just started his podcast. Cassio did some Cut. homework. Oh yeah, I try, man. I try. <laughs> he drives. Will you start my Wikipedia page he, for me? He drives a Ford Fairmount. <laughs> he's Cassio Kid, ladies What's and up, gentlemen. Man? Dude, thank you so much for being thank on the Thank you for pod. having me, dude. Yeah, man, big time. Glad to be in town. I know you, honestly, I just know you from your Rick and Bubba history, your Rick and Bubba days. Okay. You've always been a guy that has just been repeatedly, you were there before me and you keep, you know, coming back and just killing being on the show. You joined. I'm like a wart. I just pop up again every yeah, now and then. Yeah, 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 man. They burn me off a couple you times. You make an impact every time you show up. You, you did some guest spots when we did the 20th anniversary anniversary tour uh the yes. rick and bubba show we hit a couple cities in in alabama and florida and you did some stand-up sets some guest sets and just destroyed I'll do like this. <laughs> we're at the stardom comedy club we're in the green room this is the first time i've been allowed in this room really yes because you used to work here i did i i worked at the comedy club straight out of college i was trying to find a job and learn about comedy at the same time I needed some money. You don't remember this. This is when we first met. You brought me chicken fingers. What? Yeah. Was, yeah. Are you serious? No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was about to, like, lose it, man. I was going to be like, oh, my gosh, Cassio. I'm so sorry. You I remember me? I had no idea. <laughs> You're the best server I've ever had. <laughs> you even brought extra ranch like I requested like up front. I wanted. You didn't mess around with ketchup. <laughs> you just went straight ranch. Dude, yeah. So I waited tables here, and that was a trip, man. We got to talk about that. But yeah, man, you, you, you came on that Rick and Bubba tour, and you are obviously the most polished when it comes to just like joke laughs, joke laughs, joke laughs, you were, you killed it, man. And that is on, now on the DVD or the Blu-ray that we put out. And the the feedback from that, dude, we got email after email saying that was the funniest 10 minutes or whatever it was on the entire thing. Forward some of those because I've never seen that. You need that. And then okay, okay. tell Rickenville to forward me a royalties check off that <laughs> yeah, DVD. Uh, <laughs> Are you making money? I'm not making I'm not money making off money. of it. Um, you know what was fun about that is when they called to, you asked me to do it yeah uh and i said what, what what are you what are you doing what what is the format and they said it's just you know we're telling stories taking time all on the stool and then surprise guests pop up in every city mm-hmm. and i said can i what can i do and of course, you know, keep it clean. Speaking of keeping it clean, just a heads up, Casio's podcast and Casio's stand up would not be considered clean. Not at all. Just a heads up. Okay, back to Casio in the green room. And of course, you know, keep it clean. But yeah. they said, you'd literally do whatever you want to do. And I said, I think I was talking to Speedy and I said, I'm going to roast him. I'm just going to roast and him. That you did, sir. And Speedy said, that's exactly why we're calling you. So it was, uh, you know, it was what, however long I was with them for years and years and years of inside jokes and uh, things you can't say to your boss. Yeah, yeah, it was great, man. It was <laughs> and funny. I got to, uh, I got to have fun with it. And then it was fun. I won't tell any names, but it was fun. Once the first one went down, then I had other people involved that were feeding me lines that they knew they couldn't say. <laughs> so I was like. By the way, <laughs> here's a low key joke you might want to slip in. It'll right. rock. <laughs> Thank you for the material. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, man, that was just a. It was a blast. It man, a you blast. did. And you they really still. I mean, you. I saw the guys uh, just the other day when I came by the show, and uh, they still brought up the one line that I, I really think got to him a little bit is when I came on stage and said, uh, "My name was Cassio." And uh, I was part of the show in what y'all is now referred to as the funny years. The funny years. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those guys have been absolutely great to me. And I wouldn't change a thing. I'd go back and do it all again. They taught me a lot. I didn't know how much I was learning about radio at the time. 
um, because I didn't even know if I was going to be into radio. I think a lot of people that come into Rick and Bubba don't, they're not necessarily wanting to get into radio. It's just a great place to intern and to get exposure and everything. So I didn't know until I got my own radio show and got back into it. There's moments where I'm like, it was weird. I saw this from a third person point of view and didn't realize what was going down between salespeople and fans and whatever the deal may be. I learned a lot by osmosis that I didn't realize I was learning. Mainly, I thought I was just learning how to wash the station vehicle but and go get them breakfast. Right, right, right. And but, work for free. Right. And then I learned uh, I learned more than I thought I did. You mentioned getting your shot. Getting your shot on the air is one thing in, at a show like that, when you're interning at yes. a job like that. Getting your shot elsewhere. Like, people that are listening, if you work or do whatever, uh, the because everybody is gets a chance to be in the room to you know to work there to intern there. We've had tons and tons of interns come through the Rick and Bubba show that don't realize like yeah you have a chance at a shot and how you handle it how you behave um, d- will determine how well you do how the how the audience responds to you and how the guys respond to you right you know? and you did you did it the right way man you. You went about it the right way. And we have interns that come through. One, they never take a shot. They they never give it a shot. You know, they yeah. don't they don't try to get on air. Two, they try too hard to get on air. And it's obvious that's the only reason why you're here. Right. That kind of thing. And that's gonna put a bad taste in your mouth. So like whatever whatever job you may have, like understand that people need people to step up like the rick and bubba show wants interns to step up and provide content and be characters and be funny that kind of thing and dude you did it i mean like the 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 fatchler in itself (laughs) it will live on forever in in folklore in radio for folklore in the rick and bubba show for sure man and i i just can't say enough like just give you enough props man for really and yes, you were working for free. And that's one of the jokes that you say in that bit on the 20th anniversary tour. But like you said, man, like the exposure, getting your shot, learning. And uh, yeah, it's you, like, it's, you took advantage of it, man. Great it's job. Kinda, thank you, first of all. I uh, can't wait to hire you as my agent. Yes, um, sir. You got it. Uh, it's kind of like a college football team. Um, commit to the team aspect of it, even though you're trying to get your own game film for your shot, uh, right, you know, totally. somewhere else. Uh, it's kind of like if you've ever seen Last Chance, you on that's Netflix. That's a great example, dude. Commi- you got you got to contribute to the team, right. not just for you. That's You're still great. trying to get your, you know, I wanted my stuff on the air, but if my contribution that day w- really was going to get breakfast and coming back and sitting in the background and laugh, but I, I contributed it. But, and like I said, I didn't realize how much I was learning about the radio business and entertainment in general. Uh, and I, you know, I remember them, uh, you know, pulling me to the side a couple times going, you got to figure out, you got to tell us, you got something you want to be on the show? Tell us. Hey, I got a story. We might not come to it. It might be two weeks later and they go, hey, we need that story. But if you just sit back there and don't tell us you're ready to pitch in, we don't know when to throw you the ball. Yeah, man. And then when you throw, have, you know, when they throw you the ball, because, you know, me personally, I, I can imagine, I can't speak for everybody, but I'm, I can imagine a lot of interns that start with them go through this. And, and it's even a bigger aspect now. You know, when I started, it was in an old vet building in Gadsden. So, but they were already, you know, radio legends in my hometown of Gadsden. And when I had a friend uh, who at the time worked at the radio station said, they're looking for interns, you should you should go intern. And I said, I don't, what are you talking about? I was a computer science major at Gadsden State, and I was like, I don't, what, what are you talking about? And he's like, come intern with Rick and Bubba, and I'm like, I can't hang with them. You know, they were legends, and uh, he just kept on and on, and finally, you know, went down and did my interview with Speedy, and they needed interns, and, um, you know, I think, I think it's kind of a whirlwind, like the first certain amount of time, you're, you're kind of like, what am I doing here? It's kind of surreal, like watching them. I caught myself just watching as a fan when I was supposed to be doing stuff. You're like, hey, that's Rick and Bubba. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm watching him do a radio show. Yeah. It's a weird feeling when Rick hits that bed and it's too, too, too. It's real. in the house. And you're sitting in there and you're kind of just like aware of the all the little tiny speakers that are playing that <laughs> right. song right then, you know, and all the, you know, all the speakers that have played that song over and over and over then again. Then there's a while while you're interning and, and hanging around 
then there's a while where you don't get to hear the show as the show. So it's kind of the behind the scenes and you forget until maybe you go away for a certain amount of time and you come back and you're just in the car and you hear it and you're like, wow, all these memories come flashing back. And you're like, I forgot how much fun of a ride that was and the magic of radio. And, and I, you know, I can see it when I listen to them and you, I'm sure you do the same is you can, you could see it, but everybody's got their own theater of mind out there listening in their car. Totally. But you're like, I, I, I'm seeing what was going on. There's a lot of things going on. Yeah. It's man. not just, it's we're sitting there and having a good time. There's so much stuff going on behind the scenes, but, um, yeah, I, that, that, uh, Rick and Bubba was a fun ride and, and, you know, I, I owe him a lot for teaching me a lot. Uh, like you said, let me get a shot and, and let me kind of get my bearings and it taught me, I mean, through being on their show, uh, is where I met Mickey Dean, who then signed me up without me knowing it for an open mic. So, you know what I'm saying? Like if I, that all, it all flowed together on right place, right time, which is, I jokingly say all the time is kind of the, my whole career is I've been right place, right time. Um, and so that, that open mic was here. Uh, open mic was here. It's called the Broadway Room over on the side. Uh, Mickey Dean, who was a huge comic at the time, coming on the show, and he kept telling me I should try stand up. Uh, he said, "You're a good storyteller, like like I am. I'm a storyteller. You you need to go do stand up." And I was like, "What are you talking about? Again, I can't hang with Mickey Dean. If it, you know, and and being a stand up comedy fan, you're like, I can't hang with any of those. That's not me." And, um, he kept prying me, Hey, they're having an open mic. Are you having a fine one night, one day, one morning he came into the show, Rick and Bubba. And he said, what are you doing Friday night? And I said, nothing. And he said, I want you to come down to the comedy club. And I thought he was doing a show. And I was like, yeah, man, I'll come say hey and hang out. And he goes, we'll be ready. You're signed up for the open mic night. You need seven minutes of material. <laughs> and I was like, What? No, I I didn't sign seven up for it. Seven minutes, seven minutes. What are we? Well, that's crazy talk. <laughs> yeah, so because you know, in radio, they're like wrap up, wrap up. Um, but he got me out of my comfort zone. I I don't think I don't know if I ever would have took that step. You know, I I'd, I w- I was more of a Saturday Night Live fan, so I, I was trying to figure out how to get into the sketch comedy world. I didn't know how separate they were. I didn't know anything about it. I just thought that's the kind of funny I want to be. Yeah. Um, I saw, you know, I watched stand up. I was a stand up fan. Um, I, 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 I talk about it, uh, in, in other interviews I've said, I remember two times when I wanted to be a comedian. Well, my mom says when I was young, which I don't remember one time she asked me what I wanted to be. And I said, either a brain surgeon or a funny guy. Uh, I don't remember that. And she said, she, prayed my entire life for brain surgeon but uh, <laughs> unanswered prayer she said she still had faith but she's like he let me down on that one she's like <laughs> i don't think it's gonna be brain surgeon but i hope it's yeah, brain surgeon like, jesus i know you're in charge <laughs> but if we could push him towards jesus, brain take surgery. the wheel yeah um Gosh, my first funny, funny moment was uh wanting to be funny or see the power maybe of comedy i didn't realize that deep but i i remember as uh in kindergarten um or maybe first grade i I was pushing the girls on the merry-go-round and i tripped and my feet came out from under me and so now the merry-go-round is dragging me like i'm just spinning around my feet dragging well i just happened to get my feet up back under me i just kept started running again and they were dying laughing and they were like do it again and i'm like do what again? I almost died. You know, as a six year old, I was like, what are you? They were like, do it again. And I'm like, I just dropped my feet and started spinning. And they loved it. Yeah, man. That's and great. I thought, you know, I didn't, you look back on it now and you're like, that was my brain clicking. Like, hey, making people laugh. They liked me. Yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. Uh, most definitely. Uh, so I had that moment. And then I remember, I remember watching later in life, maybe as an early teenager, and to this day, I've still got a bulletin out on. I wish I could remember who it was, but it was somebody on uh, one of the late night talk shows, either Letterman or Lena or Leno or whoever was on Carson. Maybe I don't remember. I just remember I happened to be at my grandparents' house and my parents were there and late show comes on 
and they bring on this comic and he and he told the joke i like my women like i like my coffee so there's a thousand ways you could go there and he says ground up and in the freezer and i didn't even get it but you know i was too young to but i looked and saw my grandparents my parents Everybody was howling. Yeah, I'm like, right, right. Whatever just happened, I want all of that in my life. <laughs> I don't know why that was funny. Yeah, and yeah. I'm laughing with them. You know, and they're dying laughing. Yeah, and I'm like, I want that right there. Yeah, yeah. That was a that was a comedy moment for me. And so much of that joke is like just the purest form of comedy, and it's just a surprise. Yeah, like oh gosh, everybody knew coffee black. Hot and black, right. whatever the deal is. Sure. I know it now, but yeah. then I didn't know what he was even talking about. But you know the standard. I like my woman like, oh, I'm a coffee, hot and black or whatever. And then he goes hard this way. Yeah, yeah. And Pretty you're dark. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're like, and that, just to see their face, <laughs> you know. And I thought, why are my grandparents and my parents laughing at the same thing? Why am I laughing? And I don't even know what's going on. Man, that's so great. I remember uh, listening to a tape, a cassette tape of this Christian comedian, Steve Geyer. Okay. And he said, I saw a street sign the other day that said, slow men working. You're not kidding. And the whole <laughs> crowd went crazy, you know? And just me being a kid being like, okay, I can read. Signs mean one thing, right. but you can look at them and make them mean something else yeah. and make it funny. What What's happening? Yeah. Yeah, so like that was your that, moment. Yeah, I was just like, "Whoa, okay, all right, I'm yeah. in, I'm in on this." And then just watching Seinfeld, my favorite part was the stand-up bits at the very beginning right. and the end, man, where he's just laying it down, making, you know, making hacky jokes. Honestly, like a lot of <laughs> you, like you go back now and you're like, "That's kind of hacky." Like really now, well, he's setting up the show. Yeah, yeah but yeah. you're to, in your that too, totally, right? But totally. you're going, yeah, like you. You look back now, and you're like, what is he doing? Especially because you know how good he is. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you're like, what was that? But it's still him, and I still laugh at his stand-up. That's a great point, by the way. They're definitely trying to bookend the show, like right. part of the narrative. That's yeah, not hate, just his I let you in on showbiz. <laughs> that went home footage video. Thanks, man. Thanks. Now you're like, oh, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Peek behind the curtain. Thank There's you, a wizard man. behind the curtain. Look, look, man. We all didn't study at the groundlings <laughs> like you, all right, man? What, what led, when did you do that? Did you really do that? What? Study with the groundlings? Yeah. When, yeah, when did you do that? When, okay, what led so to that? 98, I, I was an intern with Rick and Bubba. Okay. Right place, right time. They moved to, as soon as I sign on, my internship's going off. They moved to Birmingham. Right place, right time. They get their one of their first big contract with a new company. Mm. Um, then... I start dabbling in stand up, and me and Don Juan from the show, um, we took a trip to Chicago, and and I I thought about moving to Chicago, and I in high school and just after I started going, what what am I going to do? How do I get on Saturday Night Live? Yeah. That was my deal. Sure, Mad sure. TV starts coming out. Oh yeah, man. So I, I'm like, I, I need that. I don't know how to get to that, but let me figure out how to get to it. So that's when you, you know, I start figuring out what improv comedy is and sketch comedy, and it's a totally different demon than stand-up comedy. Yeah. You can be great in one and awful in the other. Mm -hmm. You can be good at both, but they're just two separate things. Yeah. And we started about moving to Chicago. Um, Don Juan actually was like, hey, I, I might move to Chicago too, because I, I was looking at either Improv Olympic or Second City, because I, I saw people that came from there that were on Saturday Night Live. Uh, and then he said, hey, I'm thinking about taking a vacation to Los Angeles. And I was like, I'll go. And so we checked it out, and he was like, I might want to move to Los Angeles. Uh, A.K.A. it's warm there. It's Chicago with beautiful weather. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, and so then I did, I did some more research and found the Groundlings and uh, saw the, you know, the Phil Hartman and Lisa Kudrow and Kathy Griffin and, Sherry O'Terry, just, I mean, numerous, numerous, too long to list. Yeah, but man. Researching that, um, I saw that, and, uh, you know, life happens, and uh, at that time, uh, D, uh, Don Juan was, chose not to move. And yeah. I was like, I'm already in movement, I'm getting my wheels, I've been saving for it, 
I had life happen to me. Um, uh, some things kind of almost took me away from moving. And I thought, I got to go. I got to go before or I'm going to, because you hear it all the time, do it while you won't have regrets. And you're sitting there going, why didn't I go out there? Uh, so I, I literally, I knew one person, barely knew him. And he was the only person I knew in Los Angeles and uh, loaded up the truck with my dad, the U-Haul and drove out. And um, the the funny part of that story is the guy I knew, he was like, hey, man, when you get here, you can just crash on uh, in my guest room. Uh, he was like, I'm not sure if I want a roommate because we barely knew each other. And he was like, I kind of use it as my office, but he was like, you can kind of at least crash here and we'll figure things out then. Cause he goes, I remember how hard it was when I moved and I'm like, all right. And so I moved out there and literally in the two days that it took me and my dad to, you know, we casually just drove across country and, and moved. By the time I got there, he was engaged and now his new fiance and her kid who was like two, not his, uh, has moved in. Uh, so now the guest room is the baby's room. <laughs> so now I'm on the fold out couch. He's going to work every day, and I'm on the couch, and she's at home with the kid, so she doesn't want the fat guy sleeping on the couch. Um, uh, understandable. Right. And <laughs> so I start taking classes at the Groundlings. I'm working at wherever I can work. I worked at Little Caesars and then because uh, I worked there in high school, and so I was like, I'll just get a part-time job there, keep some kind of money coming in. And working at Little Caesars, worked at a medical supply, you know, just wherever you can get a job and started taking classes at the Groundlings. And I came home one time and he was on the front porch of the apartment, front steps. And he was like, hey, man, me and my wife or my wife, me and my fiance got in a big argument. And I'm like, oh, man, and he's like bad. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of escalated and. She's kind of like, she didn't get engaged to two guys and like, you know, you, she didn't know you were part of the deal and like it's, she doesn't want you staying here. And I'm like, well, believe me, I'm, I don't like staying here. I'm trying to get out. And he goes, well, one thing led to another and she stabbed me in the leg with a fork and he's got like this bloody wound on his jeans. <laughs> and she was like, he was like, man, she said either you or her had to go. And I'm like, well, I'll help you pack her stuff, brother. Because <laughs> she stabbed you in the leg. Surely I won. I've never stabbed you in the leg. <laughs> and he was like, no, nah, man, I just love her. It's, uh, sorry, buddy. I did not pick you. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, that was my first time I lost The Bachelor. Um, so literally that night I had to go to a hotel. Like they had my stuff packed. Oh, my gosh. So then for the next couple months two or three months i was homeless i would just either stay in a hotel or i would park my truck at the train station or bus station or whatever and uh then go to class and finally luckily some people in my class found out about it because you know you don't want to tell everybody you're homeless right everybody at back home is going how's it going i'm like i'm living at the bus stop <laughs> sleeping in my truck it's I get great. a hotel tonight so i can shower <laughs> off a little bit uh, you know, so you, you, everybody thinks you're living the Hollywood dream, and I'm like, <laughs> La La Land, yeah. man, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. So, uh, gosh, that's funny. So man. yeah, then I started gosh. couch surfing till I till I luckily found out. You know, ended up meeting friends through friends, and ended up staying where I was going to stay. So, and then right place, right time, where I end up staying. Um, a guy, shout out to my my buddy Alfred. Um, he had his roommate was about to move out. And his ex, he went to University of Alabama, and his roommate from Alabama was now a teacher with my mom. And she was talking about how her son had moved to L.A., and he was like, we well, need to meet another Southern guy, meet my ex-roommate, Alfred. And when I meet, his roommate is moving out. She was on this reality show called Joe Millionaire, where they acted like he was a millionaire. And at oh, the end, he was wow. like a construction dude. Oh, so all the girls man. got duped. Uh, so that was weird. Like, I watched the show and I come in and, like, because I didn't, I've never met her before. And I walk in, I'm like, you look familiar. And she's Joe like, Billionaire? Yeah. She's like, uh, I don't know if you ever saw Joe Millionaire. I was like, <laughs> yeah, you got duped. You know, like, that was a great first meet. You're an idiot. You're you a gold digger, punk, right? Man. You're a gold digger. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 
I meet him, and she happens to be moving out and ended up moving with him. Well, he lives, uh, we lived at Kings and Melrose in apartments, which is about a mile and a half from the Groundlings. And one night I'm walking to class of the Groundlings, and there's Leno on the street. Right place, right time. I just moved down there. So it's like another case of whatever you want to say it is. You want to say the higher power, whatever higher power you believe in, put me in the right spot. I mean, you know, like you were saying earlier, you got to know how to hit the shot. (laughs) So Jay Leno just saw you on the street. Uh, Yeah, they um, walking down Melrose, going to a class of the Groundlings. Um, They were doing, you know, he does man on the street interviews. Well, living there and seeing how they do it, sometimes he's not there. They just film a segment with him not there. Um, So I'm walking and there's this commotion, of course, uh, and he's, he's in front of the Johnny Rockets on Melrose and this commotion and this this guy comes up to me he's like hey man what are you doing i'm like uh just walking and he's like you want to be on the tonight show and i'm like no nah. <laughs> and he's like what and i'm like no nope, i'm late for class i'm going to class and he's like come on man just stay around we need some people to volunteer and i'm like what are you doing and he's like hey you just talk to jay and i'm like jay's here and he's like yeah and i'm like what are we doing and he's goes, he goes well it's kind of a surprise but i mean if you stand here you'll see somebody else do it it's basically like he'll just interview you and then it, it'll cut to you dancing. So in the studio, when they do it, they'll do the interview and then pause it and let the crowd decide whether you're going to be a good dancer or a bad dancer and then cut to your dancing. Well, again, perfect timing. I've got Rick and Bubba t-shirt on. And I was like, all right. Uh, I said, but I'm late. You're gonna have to push me to the front of the list. Nice. And he's like, uh, I guess, you know, he's just a lackey production assistant. Yeah. And so he's like, yeah, let me talk to some people, sign your waiver, you know, blah, blah. blah. And uh, so I did. I, I, a rider comes over and he's like, yeah, we'll put you to the front. And uh, I, he's like, wait, you know, he's like trying to make, I guess, keep me calm before we go on because they're doing another one. And he's like, what are you doing, man? And I'm, I'm like, I'm going to class at the Groundlings. And like his eyes just lit up like, oh, we got a player. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? <sighs> he goes, well, have fun. <laughs> and so... Uh-huh. Uh, we do the segment, perfect timing. Cop pulls up. If you ever find it on YouTube or wherever it's at, uh, I can't post it on YouTube because I'm not NBC. Yeah, uh, right. they've ripped it down twice when I've tried to put my own video. Okay, up. <laughs> dang it, I was going to use it for the podcast. You might can find it. I think there's a bootleg version where somebody did like a VCR version. Okay, okay. Um, a cop happened to pull up in the middle of the scene because he didn't know they were shooting. He just saw a commotion. And as soon as he pulled up, you know, Leno's genius. He's like, yeah, that he, I was dancing. He just grabbed me. He's like, they're coming to get you. I'm like, <laughs> it was like a perfect deal. Perfect storm. Go do that. Uh, and like they called months later, you know. They just called you. Yeah, because they got your info from your waiver. Yeah, yeah. And they called and were like, hey, uh, you did the segment with us. It's going to air tomorrow night. And I'm like, oh, perfect. So. That's when I called and I, you know, I tell Rick and Bubba and all them like, Hey man, I'm in your shirt. Like it's going to be on. So luckily they, you know, do the plug and tell everybody to watch and you, you know, you're telling all your friends and stuff. And, um, so it airs and, you know, luckily the Rick and Bubba army is great. And, uh, yeah, I like to think there was random strangers that did it too. But, uh, months later, just, I mean, months, uh, I got a call from a guy, and uh, he goes, this is Scott Atwell. I'm the casting director for The Tonight Show. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, hey, man, we got a lot of positive feedback from your segment. And I uh, was going to w- want to see if you'd be interested in coming in and doing something with us. And I'm like, who is this? Who is this? And he goes, it's Scott Atwell. I'm the casting director. He's kind of chuckling. And I'm like, bull. <laughs> I tell him. And he's like, what? And I'm like. Yeah, I don't believe you. This is somebody from back home or somebody playing a game on me and he's dying laughing. He goes, well, do you want to call the NBC switchboard and get connected back to me? And I'm like, yes. I would like that. And I hung up on him. <laughs> I called. I looked the number up. I call him and he's laughing as he as they patch me through. And he goes, is that are we good now? And I'm like, 
yeah, now I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I was a little brave last time. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. And he's dying live. He's like, nah, people don't believe me all the time. Um, so he's like, are you interested? I'm like, has, has anybody said no to that? I was like, nah, not interested in doing something with you guys. Yeah. Uh, so they bring me in. He's like, come in, let's talk about it. So I, I show up NBC lot and I'm, you know, I'm pulling up. When you go through the gate on NBC production lot and your name's there in the gate, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'm famous. Dude, Dude you this know. is real. <laughs> yeah. That's so amazing. You park and like, Nancy Grace is walking by me and I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing here? You know, that's when the, the redneck really comes out. I'm like, hey, I'll shut. Oh, man. We're on the moving pictures. <laughs> and so I go in and uh, the guy that was kind of talking to me on the side that was uh, on location, uh, I figured out his name was Dave Hansen and he was a writer. He's one of the writers. He was the either first or second longest tenured writer at that time uh, for The Tonight Show. And Scott Atwell was there, and I, there were some other people there. I don't remember, but um, they started like, hey, what's your story? And I'm like, hey, I moved out here from Alabama. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, get into the business. And they were like, well, that's the idea we had was let's don't stray far from the truth. Let's just have you trying to break into the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I've, I'll never forget Scott Atwell looking at me and going, here's what we need. You can't change your voice. Like <laughs> that's the that's gonna be the shit. I'm like, I would change it if I could change it by now. Uh, I'm in Los Angeles. If I could have changed it, I would have changed it. Um, it hasn't really helped <laughs> right? yeah, exactly. so far. Not a not a positive thing coming out of these uh, lips. So not really narrating nature documentaries <laughs> right? no, at this point. No voice work yet. Um, so. Man, we just start talking about it, and they're like, well, there's a Britney Spears uh, show coming up and uh, at the Staples Center, and maybe we maybe we take him down there. I mean, they like, like start talking like I'm not in the room. They're, maybe we take him down there, and he's like trying to break into being a pop star, and we'll send him down there like, yeah, you think we can make it happen? Can we call Staples? We got to get... Do you Clarence. think he's like talented enough to do this? I don't know. What do you think? I'm I mean, here. I'm have, right here. We're gonna have to get him a haircut. You know, just uh, change his wardrobe. <laughs> right. Uh, and I'm and they're like, you know what? Let's do that. I'll get on the phone. Blah blah. And so I'm thinking, oh, well, this is cool. You know, we're gonna make something happen. And this was a I mean, either Monday or Tuesday. And I'm like, so I just like first words after all that was. When is this concert? And they're like, Thursday. And I'm like, like in two days, <laughs> I'm going to make my first segment for the Tonight Show. And they're like, yeah, that's why we brought you in here. We're moving. We're <laughs> making a show, guy. We do a show every night, buddy. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you, you got four. We got four more of these today. <laughs> exactly. We got all these other, uh, you know, characters to do. So they that was my first one. They sent me to Britney Spears, uh, talking to the people in the crowd. And then they're like, look. It's going to take a lot to edit. We've got a, you know, we've got segments planned out. Plus, we've got to edit, and um, it might not ever make it to air. Just to be honest with you, might not ever make it to air. Good part is you're now in AFTRA. You're going to be in the union, um, and you know you, you get paid for the day we shot. And I'm like, yeah, that's called rent. I'll take it. Yeah, man. So we film it, and months go by, and I'm like, this is my luck. Like nothing's going to happen. So as months go by, are you just working in, in LA? Yeah, I'm doing, um, uh, medical sales or something. Well, I did, I did. Yeah. I was in a, a medical supply company. I actually, George Costanza, George Costanza style got a job there. I was a sales assistant at the radio stations in Birmingham. And so on this job site, they were looking for a sales assistant. So I put in for sales assistant. Well, I didn't know at the same time they were looking for a logistics coordinator. Uh, so they send like implants out and the actual surgical kit to hospitals uh, for when they do hip replacement, shoulder, elbow, knee, all the replacements. They just rent the kit from this guy 
And then the guy supplies the implants and, you know, so that like it's all delivered in a big tub, the whole deal. And I know this is LA and we're talking about implants, but this is not, no, it no. wasn't those kind of implants. Not the fun implants. <laughs> These are 80 year old ladies in their hips. Um, so we, I go in, they ask me for an interview and I think I'm going in for sales position and like two questions in. I can tell she's interviewing me for logistics coordinator. And instead of bailing, I'm like, I'm going to BS my way through this. <laughs> Worst case happens, they go, you're not available, but we should hire you for the assistant, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, man. Two days later, I'm now the logistics coordinator. There you go. Well, yeah, but I'm like, I don't, fake I don't it even know what I'm doing. It, I don't even fake know it till you I'm make doing. it. You've heard that. Well, yeah. I, long story short, uh, we got to the end of my six month probation period, and I was no longer the logistics coordinator. Uh, yeah, but sure, sure. I paid for some rent again. <laughs> there you go. Trying to make man. another rent check. Yeah. Man. So yeah, at that time, I'm doing that, and uh, they finally call. Hey, you're going to be on. It's going to be on tomorrow night. Pick you up in the car at your apartment because you know the whole deal. I get there, and uh, on the show is uh, George Carlin. Oh my and gosh. I think maybe, oh, it's Gavin DeGraw as a musical guest. Are you serious? That's and great. Man. Yeah, it's like, it, <laughs> and it was, so you get there and you got your dressing room and you, you like see everybody else's dressing room. And I still got, I took the name plaque good, out. And good, good. Like, so you go there and they have, I didn't realize they have like a run through, a dry walk through before everybody gets in. So literally that's the first time besides that segment that I met Leno. I go on the stage. Right where he does the monologue, he's in his all jean outfit that you all see him in. And um, he's like doing a loose script, cue cards. There's your cue cards. Like, I'm basically like on the set, like learning as we're, I'm like, oh, wait, there's, oh, whoa, this is the Tonight Show. Dude. And he goes, all right, y'all got the clip? And they're like, yeah. And he's like, all right, let's watch it. So we, I've never even seen one second of it. And I'm watching it now, standing next to Jay with Leno. Jay Leno. Gosh, and so brutal. it's watching and like, yeah, but like he, like you know, he does his little chuckle. He seemed to like a couple it. Times. He's like, <laughs> and I'm like, I made you another laugh. Is there a wardrobe? I'm gonna need to change my pants now. <laughs> um, so we we do that, and uh, we go back, and uh, you know, he, uh, the writer comes in, Dave, and he's like, hey man, it's gonna be great. This had to pass like seven levels. If at any point it wasn't funny, it would have been cut. It's got to go through writers, head writers, producers, directors, and then it ends up on Jay. He's got to watch it. So the whole deal. So I'm like, okay, that kind of calmed me down. So now I'm in my I'm in my dressing room, and they bring like this fruit tray, and this guy comes, and he's like got a mini cart with like like an airplane beverages cart, and he's like, hey, you want this is called the J Bar? Would you like anything? I'm like, I. Maybe my seventh appearance, I'll be drunk on television. <laughs> yeah, Let me get past right. this first one. I don't need a drink right yeah, now. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not re- doing great right now, but I don't <laughs> yeah. think that's going to help. I really need that, really, probably, <laughs> but not at this moment. Um, I remember eating uh, fruit that I thought was cheese sticks, uh, and it was like, I think it's called Heart of Palms or something like that. I don't know what that is. Looks just like string cheese, oh. but it's like the inside of a vegetable. <laughs> It was like a turnip or something. What a bummer. <laughs> it's, it's like broccoli. I'm like, oh, I love cheese sticks. <laughs> I'm eating a root. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not like in my dressing room, like spitting root out. So then uh, Jay, I knock on the door and it's Jay Leno. And he comes in and I'm like, you know, I'm trying to stay calm. He goes, hey, man, you nervous? I'm like, yeah, really nervous. And he's like, good. That means you're normal. And he goes, don't worry about it. If it wasn't good. It wouldn't be on the show tonight. And no matter what happens, mom and dad and everybody's going to think you're a rock star back home. And I'm like, Dude, sweet. that's amazing. He came and talked yeah. to you and said that to you. That's great. He didn't have to do that. No. So we do the segment. I distinctly remember we're about to go out. Tour uh, Stage manager is there and they're like, hey, man, you know, just kind of relaxing you. You're going to walk through this curtain. You're going to take that hard left. And they're like, one thing that's not there and walk through, he does his monologue from this stage that slides out into the crowd. And then when he's done, it slides back and deal. So like, there's one step to get to him. <laughs> Don't memorize the old path. There's a new <laughs> yes. path. We've added another <laughs> obstacle on live television. Oh my gosh. They, they technically can cut 
but they're they're so close of window you know they're doing this on west coast time and it's real like two hours out and they feed it live down to the stations yeah man and so they're like you know don't fall yeah <laughs> and i think she saw my wheels turning because i legit was like i'm gonna go Pratt fall i'm sitting there and my my wheels start turning i'm like what if I fell? Falling would be fun. Into the crowd, right yeah. past Jay Leno. Right, right, right. You know, Chris Farley's my deal. So I'm like, this is I him know, falling man. into a coffee I table. know, dude. Yeah. So I'm like, let's do this. And I literally see the stage manager. She goes, don't fall on purpose. Like, it was on my face. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> She's like, do not fall on purpose. I wasn't going like, to. Yeah, I'm like, who should have had to do that, idiot? <laughs> what, do you think I'm living in a van <laughs> down by the river? Now, now I'm sweating. I'm like, I always wanted to take a drink. I'm like, the whole deal. I'm like, this is crazy. And, and so I went out and did the thing, you know, and then and, um, um, and the rest of it, I ended up being on there eight times in two and a half years. Dude, yeah. They had some turnover, uh, so I ended up coming off the show. Um it's really weird, you know. They, I distinctly remember that time in television. Survivor on CBS was like the biggest thing. Okay, and it was getting a really good lead in for CBS late night, and they were actually worried that Letterman uh, might take over a little bit, and so they did like a whole turnover, fired like four writers. So like, uh, Dave Hansen was like my pitch man because I was his project. So every time I'm on there is. It's one of his guys. Yeah. Uh, and so when he goes, now nobody's, I'm not on anybody's team. Right. I'm still in the mix. Right, right. And like, so every now and then somebody would have like a pitch for me. Yeah. But they got their own projects they want on, their right. own friends or their own, I discovered this guy or whatever the case yes, may be. For sure. Which is, you know, it's show business. Yeah, yeah. And so I did one, after he left, I did one segment and then there's not even like an official firing. You just. Yeah. Yeah. You're out of the rotation. Yeah, yeah. And then one of my deals was when I came in, it was when uh, Leno had this guy, it was called Ross the Gay Intern. It was very funny, very famous. And he uh, he left to go try to do his own show. He got his, like, his own spinoff. Well, it didn't work, and he came back. And now it was overcrowded. And they're like, Tom Green was a correspondent then. Wow. Stutter and John is the from Howard Stern, yeah. the announcer. Wow. So it was like, you know, it was a, it was a crazy time, but uh that whole time I was doing, you know, groundlings and the and the whole deal working production, doing being a production assistant on television shows and stuff like that. Yeah, man, it's nuts to see like everything you do is a step. Like me working here. Right. I at the club. At this club. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh at the Stardom waiting tables. That's all I did. I didn't I didn't get any stage time while I was here, but that was a step. Yeah. You know, it's so crazy to like look back and be like, all right, that's when I learned that. I didn't know I was learning that, but that's when I did. But you got to, yeah, you're you're learning and you don't realize how much you're learning. And then you got to realize it is a step and I've got to take that next step, whatever that may be, is is getting motivated to go, all right, I got I got to another plateau here. Now, what do I do after this? Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's. You know, uh, people ask me a lot, do I miss L.A.? And yeah, I would I would do L.A. over again, even though I have no complaints about my life. But yeah, yeah. I mean, that that is a creative world of creative people. And, you know, I would I would go back. I would go back, you know, if, if something ever happened. But, yeah, you know, life just took me in a different direction. <laughs> Notice the white people not saying anything like that. <laughs> We're going on stage in like 30 minutes here. Yes. What time? Yes, it's, thirty minutes. It is five fifty-four. So yeah, thirty minutes. Okay, and you're um, you're opening. You're the feature. What feature. It, the feature. Opening is that is that like a derogatory? Well, I'm term? technically still an opening the part. The official term for a stand-up show is a MC, a feature, and a headliner. Okay. MC comes out first, does a few minutes, does some announcements, fill out the comment cards, then the feature comes out, does. Anywhere between fifteen and thirty minutes, depending on the show, and then the headliner comes out and finishes it all up. And you're doing thirty minutes or so, or what do you yeah. do? Tonight I'll do about twenty five minutes. Nice, nice. Um, usually, usually headline. Um, don't mind featuring um, at clubs I like, like this, you know. And for people like friends, Rocky's a friend. 
So if it, you know if he wants me to work with him on the show, boom, work with him on the show. Love featuring for a celebrities or my egos. Look, I'm not going to be the next Dave Chappelle. So <laughs> if you want to pay me to come do 25 minutes, I can do a tight 25 minutes. Yeah, man. I mean that's featuring is the easiest part for me personally. In my opinion, featuring is the easiest part on the bill. MC has to go up. Everybody's ordering dinner, yeah. ordering drinks, settling in, learning how to be quiet. Why so and so here? And you know you're you're doing you're basically doing ten to fifteen minutes over them talking. Yeah, yeah, man. And they don't know you from Adam, so they don't <sighs> care. Dude, I waited tables here, like I said, and this was such a brutal place to learn how to wait tables. I had never done like a, a like waitering job before, right. and everybody comes in at the same time. Yes, because the crowd is here for a show. Over four hundred people. Yeah, they and the show starts at a specific time, so the people are going to be here at a certain yeah. time. The doors open at a certain time before the show, and so everybody shows up at once. Everybody sits down at once. Everybody's food orders go in to the yes. kitchen at once, and this is not and like drinks and and drinks. Yeah, the bar has to have yeah. them ready, like and like. You know, you're trying to get to the just the kiosk just to get people's orders in. Everybody wants to check out at the same time. You got to work that timing right. You got to feel the comic and know when it's supposed See, to the, shut down. It was tough. The MC, you're doing all that while y'all are doing all that. So it's chaos. Feature comes out with no pressure. Nobody's expecting you to be funny. They don't even know who you are if they if they came to see the headliner usually. No pressure. Now I got 20 minutes. Now the headliner goes on. They've either... I mean, they've paid money, so they assume it's going to the headliner. Yeah. So now the pressure's on the headliner. Yeah, man. Um, and also, what people don't realize, uh, and a lot of people learn it the hard way when you first start headlining, is you got 50 minutes, an hour to kill. Well, 30 minutes in, they're going to be dropping checks, which is a really weird thing to learn. Yeah, um, yeah. Because right in the middle of whatever joke you're on, they're going, man, you, you got pitch here for the cheese sticks. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Who had Budweiser? <laughs> we didn't have Budweiser. Oh, yeah, Budweiser. My apologies. <laughs> you know, you, the people pitching in money, dividing checks. Four buckets? Yeah. yeah exactly. We had four buckets? Yeah. Well, you charged me for two items. I didn't have, was there a minimum on it? You know, it's a, it's a. Tough. And then there's, that's when the wait staff's coming. That's when you're getting checks and you're bringing it back. They're figuring out how much to tip. All that's going on, usually at the end of your set when you're trying to do, I need to bang and get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, that's, Headliner's got all the pressure, and then the MC has the worst part of the show, timing-wise, of like you said, we got 400 people ordering dinner and drinks, and the waiters and wait staff are running everywhere trying to get it in, uh, you know, as fast as they can, and meanwhile... You're trying to start your career out and go, hey, listen to me for seven minutes, please. You know. And by the way, fill out your copy card. <laughs> right, yeah. And so right, it's like, man. it's the feature is the easiest part of the night. Stand-up comedy is so brutal. It is the, it, it's, it's the purest, one of the most pure things ever. Cause like it is, the proof is in the pudding. You know, you've heard that saying yeah. before, like you can be in the room. Like, if, if somebody's out there like reading poetry Somebody in the room, it can mean one person to one thing and another thing to another person. And like at the end of the night, people be like, oh, that was a great poetry reading. <laughs> right. Comedy, it's just shows, man. You know, it, it's there, well, it's man. Instant no it's denying. Instant it. reaction. Um, there's no way to spin it. If they don't laugh, you weren't funny. Now, if you're getting into stand-up and you want to get a peek on what it's like, my favorite stand-up book ever is Steve Martin, Born Standing Up. Nice. Um, he does a really good. It's just about his stand-up career, and he talks about all the nuances of you could be doing a you could be doing a legit funny joke. Well, what if the waiter in the back corner drops a glass? Well, now everybody's turning around looking at that, and they miss the setup. You do the punch, and it doesn't hit, and you go, "Oh, that joke's not good." Right. Right. And you. So it's like there's. Yes, it could be funny material, but everything has to still properly line up. Yeah, yeah. And be, I distinctly remember doing a, a set here at the Stardome in the Broadway room, the side room. I'm still doing open mics. And the comic before me, who was a little twitchy before the show, I didn't know him. You know, we're all amateurs. Yeah. And he's like, this is my first time here. I'm excited, blah, blah, blah. 
and he starts doing a bit about the first time he hooked up with his girlfriend. And he said, I'm so excited that, I, you know, I run in and I just fly in like Superman. And he literally jumps off the stage onto the table that's in the front row. How did that go? Well, their food and drinks went flying all over them. The tables broke like it's in the middle of a wrestling match. And by the way, there's six other comics that now have to come up with this d- slanted table where all the foods ran down. Look, he's <laughs> got ranch on them and you know ketchup on their face. And you're like, hey, I'm fat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Being fat's yeah, funny, you're right? Trying not to act like you don't see a broken <laughs> table. Dude, you mentioned it, man. The uh, like the the glass breaks, yeah, and the whole room turns. Yes, you have to acknowledge it. You have to feel the room. You yeah. have to you have to call it, man. One of the best one of the best examples of that, and it just showed how polished you were and how much time you had spent on stage. It just takes time, you know. Is when we were on the twentieth anniversary tour, you had a couple jokes, and I'm not going to ruin it for anybody that hasn't seen it. You, you got to go pay for it or wherever it is. Go buy it. Go find it. But um, you you said a couple jokes, and then there was a African American security guard that was just kind of like watching one of the exits, you know. Mm-hmm. And you go, "I'm sorry, Mister Security Guard," and the whole place <laughs> went crazy, man. Like you hadn't acknowledged him, you hadn't, you know, but but everybody knows. Like there's there's different people at all the doors watching the doors, and it just so happened like close to the stage there was a <laughs> black guy watching the door over there. And you were like, and I'm, by the way, I'm sorry, Mr. Security Guard. And the whole place went crazy. Like, I'm sorry, Mr. Security Guard will go on in history as one of the best, like, causing, you know, calling out right. of what's happening in the room. But see, that, go, that goes back to, I mean, if you watch stand up enough in the live setting, I'm not talking about watching somebody's Netflix special. Yeah, watch yeah. the live setting. There's some comics that don't want to. Delve off into the crowd whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. You have and that, to. That though, doesn't mean sometimes. they're not a good comic. Totally. That just that's their comfort zone. Yeah. Uh don't mean they couldn't crush it if they went out, but their comfort zone is I want I got this material and I want to test all this material. I want to do this material and do their set, you know, and that's that's their style. Uh and then me, uh, coming from an improv sketch comedy background, uh, when I got back into stand up, I had to figure out how to make that transformation like how because i'm comfortable doing improv i'm not a good comedy writer i don't have notebooks and notepads of jokes right i just tell a story that's funny i hear something that's funny whatever the case may be and i go i want to try that on stage yeah and, that's funny my perspective on that right. is funny and i can polish this to make other people think this is right yeah but the only and the only way to figure that out is try it on stage yeah but i'm also uh you know when i when you first uh, start doing longer shows, moving from the MC to the feature, moving from the feature to the headlining. It's it's like a running joke in stand up comedy. There's little clubs will go, Hey, can you headline? Do you have you have an hour? And like no comics ever went, No. It's always like, Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, I don't really have an hour, but I can fill an hour. I have thirty minutes. Right. It turns I a, out. I got a decent thirty. Yeah. But I can f- you don't want to turn down a check. You don't want to go, yeah. I got my first headline. Or an gig. opportunity or anything. Yeah, yeah man. So uh, for me, that transition was, I'm going to talk to the crowd a little bit. Yeah. AKA, I don't have enough material right now, <laughs> but I have an hour to fill. There you go. Um, so, you know, that that's another transition of, I like messing with the crowd. I like talking to the crowd. Yeah, yeah. There's also a balance um, of talking to the crowd and it goes really well too early if you go back into material they're like why are you doing jokes i like you making fun of that dude in the hawaiian shirt right right that right. was really funny because they knew that was off the cuff you, yeah the audience has to feel like you come out with a bang all right we like you we support you let's go and then that ride has to kind of just go up it has to yeah it has to keep building and building there's a otherwise you know, people are like where are we going they feel lost they feel like this night isn't you know gonna end on a everybody right. wants to end on the best note ever you yeah. know things everybody wants things to get better as they go and it's so hard to build that crescendo and, and then end on a bang man. i used to look i'm not this isn't the art of stand-up with me I, i'm not a i'm not a good stand-up guy but when i first started doing it I, my game plan going out was my best joke biggest most consistent laugh i'm ending with that's my closer then i started figuring out whatever that second one is 
second, just not the closer, was now my opener. Yep. We're going to fill the time in between. Yep. Because when you first go out on stage, yep. everybody's arms crossed. Yep. They're waiting on the first laugh. Then we can all exhale. Yep. So there's a couple quick one-liners that I have, especially when I was early on, that I could basically tell whether the night was going to be good or bad. Yeah, man. I could do the line, and if it just was okay, I'm like, well, this crowd is a poop. Okay? <laughs> Dude, um, I've done bits on the Rick and Bubba show, and you know within 15 seconds that the next five minutes is going to be good or the next yeah. five minutes is going to be bad, man. And I've, I've, when you throw that first joke out there, right. and it just goes, <laughs> you're just like, Shh. And we were, t- we were, t- you know, me and uh, Rocky Dale Davis is is working here this weekend uh, when we're recording this, and you know we've we've talked about it all weekend, and he's like, man, I, maybe I shouldn't have done the crowd work as early because it was on fire, uh, or you, you also get in your comfort zone as a stand up comic. The more you're in it, you more you you want to try new material, but you're also like, man. This old stuff works it, good. Yeah, it really works good. <laughs> yeah, man. If I take out this guaranteed laugh and I want to try this and it doesn't, then you're ticked at yourself for messing your show up. Yes, yes. And what if that's what they remembered you by? What if they're like, that's the moment where they're like, not funny. I'm going to start looking at my phone. Totally, Or totally. start talking to the guy next to me. Gosh, so that's yeah, that man. fear factor also. As, as comfortable as you are, when it's time to do, because there's no way to know if, if a bit is funny until you get a laugh. By real strangers in a yes. crowd on a stand-up stage. Yes, so like, man, real strangers, dude. Hey, guys, I got like seven new bits I'm going to try tonight. And you get on stage, <laughs> you're like, hey, these jokes are 20 years old. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not doing anything new because y'all are enjoying yourself right now. <laughs> I'm good at this stuff, but right. chances are it'll work. And then it's like, you know, like this weekend with me featuring, there's people that have never seen me before. So if I do 20 minutes of rock and roll, They'll go, I want to come back when you're headline. Do you headline? Yeah, I headline. I'm going to come back. Well, if I take that time to try something new, they're like, I'm not going to see him. Right, right. You didn't do 20 minutes. Right, right, man. So brutal, dude. <sighs> it's Stand up to crazy, controlled chaos. It's an art form for a reason. There's, there's, there's some kind of science behind it, but it's not really all exact science because it's basically just... Make the majority of the people laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After that, however you get to that point, that's how you got to that point, really. You know, I've had I've had added little throwaway lines, like in regular bits that I do, and I thought I would get through and go, did somebody record that? Because I remember something crushed right in the middle of that. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, do you record your sets? Or I you used to do it all the time. Now I'm make... lazy. Yeah, yeah. Um. Uh yeah, I went I went through a time where I I, I was okay mainly because I was doing the same stuff over and over. Right, right, right. Um, so for a while I didn't. Uh, and then there's you know there's nights where you're like, I'll just do a show. Yeah. And something happens, and you're like, oh, that was golden. Well, I didn't. But the worst is you do it. It's a normal show. Not that it's a bad show, but it's a normal show, and you're like, I did all this work. Now I gotta go. You know, and and I'm not a good video editor or anything like that. So it's right, like, right, right. I mean, you you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into, let's get ready for that point. Then what are we doing with it? Are we just throwing away? Do I keep? I don't know. Basically, I'm lazy. <laughs> so I do not record all my shows. But I can tell that also you're not lazy to the point where you're that guy that is like making jokes about how big cell phones are, you know, or just what you're just like, you know, you are painfully aware. Take that one out of the set tonight. <laughs> My old cell phone did. You're just so painfully aware that like, all right, every joke has its time and its place. And like, as soon as you feel like this joke, all right, this joke might've killed for five years, for yeah. 10 years or whatever. Once you feel it fading, you're like, yeah. that is not, that is not something I can trust anymore. That's, that's out. Right. And, 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 and the people that don't look at their jokes and their sets that way, they just they but fade, man. You also see, it's really weird. I was talking to it with a, with actually a fan last night at the show. Drove down from Huntsville, two hour drive. He was a fan of Rocky. He saw I was going to be on the show, and him and his wife were like, "We're driving down." Yeah, which is like, whoa, two hour drive is is a big commitment, sure. you know, from somebody. And so he before the show, he's just being a fan talking to me, and he goes, 
do you still do that Las Vegas bit? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I love it. Well, I left and I'm like, back here, I go, wait, is he expecting me to do that bit tonight? <laughs> or does he go, I've already seen it. Right. Is he going to go, oh, I did it again. Right, right, right. Because when you go see a band, you go, play the hits. I want to hear Take It Easy right. if I'm seeing the freaking <laughs> Eagles. And then there's another one you're like, uh, comic, I know when, now now they know when the improv's not improv. They know when you're, you know, they yeah, know your nuances. Man. And it's like, well, I do got to give them something new. You got to find that mix. Yeah. If, if you are that well-known comic, it's like, all right, there are some hits that people want to hear, but how do I sprinkle them in and well, make it work in the narrative? One of my favorite stand-up comics of all time is Brian Regan. Oh, me too, man. He's the only comic I've ever seen do it. He did a show. Have you ever seen him live? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if he did it at your show. The tour I saw him on, did the set, walks off to applause, comes back out, and takes requests from what the crowd. What you guys want to hear? Yes, same here. Yeah. The first time I saw it, I'm like, "What?" He's like, "Yeah, yeah." So come in. Yeah, we're at the green room with Stardom. Somebody's coming in, and it is the sound guy, <laughs> Joseph. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah, I remembered it. Were you at Shades Mountain Baptist Church like a couple weekends ago? I was playing drums that day. Were you? Yeah, yeah. You were behind the soundboard up there, right? Yeah. 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 You're in the podcast now. I've, I played drums this morning. I broke my hand or a couple blood. blood. You see that? My, does my hand look weird to you? It's a little red. Yeah. What'd you do? I was playing the cajon and I, I broke. Excuse a me? Oh, you broke a couple. Is this a clean podcast? <laughs> <laughs> it's a musical I mean, instrument. Lay in the cajon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me crash your party here at the start. So now we got a post show. Now this is post show. This is post show. What do you think? You crushed it, man. It was amazing, dude. Good. I'll come back on. It's chaos in here. Gosh. See, now that we're done with our set, the tension is off and we're I relaxed. Oh, man. We're seriously. We're about to get paid. Seriously, seriously. I don't know about Jessica, but I am. A lot of money. <laughs> Tons of money. It's just buckets. Seriously, thank you so All much. Right. I need, what I honestly want to do is come up to Huntsville because I wanted to talk wrestling with you. We got a lot to talk about. I wanted to talk so many things with you. Yeah, yeah. So honestly, I, I want to shut this down right now. I have a <laughs> episode from you. I have a full Casio episode from you. You got part of the come up story, right? Dude, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for telling me that. You want to need a current that. day story now? That's what we'll do next time, a current day. Okay, sure, sure, yeah. Because we got up to now, basically. Okay, great, great, dude, yeah. I, I'm just you, making stuff up. You've been too kind. You brought me in. Like You you, you said like to all the people that are around at this comedy club, like, this guy is cool. You know, like, right. those, like, subtle... I mean, it's a lie. I'm going to have to deal with it later. Yeah, but... I'm not cool, but... <laughs> it's fine. If you want a shirt, I'll share it. If you don't, don't feel bad. Get a picture of me. Tell me you had a good time. Follow me on social media. That's all the comedians you see tonight. Best thing you can do for our career. Cassioscut.com at Cassio's Cut on social media. I'm at the Cassio Kid. There's only one S. Don't put extra ass in the middle of Cassio. Don't uh, do that. Yeah. yeah, just normal, normal ass there. Uh, the Cassio Kid on social media. Follow me over there, man. Awesome. Appreciate it, man. That's it for this episode, and the nonprofit of the week is the Downtown Rescue Mission. They have locations across the state of Alabama, and Cassio just finished a fundraiser for Downtown Rescue Mission of Huntsville. He set a goal of raising 5,000 bucks, which he met, and so Cassio had to shave his head, which is why Cassio in this episode looks like Darth Vader with his helmet off. Cassio's words, not mine. For more info on the Downtown Rescue Mission, Casio's radio, podcast, and stand-up shows, and everything else mentioned in this podcast, you can go to Adler.tv. If you enjoyed it, please give this episode a thumbs up and a comment on YouTube and a review and a rating in Apple Podcasts. Uh, tell your friends if you feel so inclined. It really does help. It really does make a difference. Thank you so much for checking out this podcast. I will see you next week.